Two Sundays ago, the servant of Isaiah was ministering on the subject, God-driven church and a need-driven church. To be need-driven is to prioritize your need above God's needs. And when you are God-driven, you prioritize God's needs above your need. God has an inheritance in you and I. But we only choose to use those who tremble at his word. Pastor gave us a list of scriptures while ministering about two Sundays ago. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11. Just doing a recap. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. Hebrews 12, 25 to 29. Isaiah 66, 1 to 5. And Agai 1, verses 1 to 9. And he concluded by quoting from Agai 1, verse 5. Consider your ways and prioritize God today. The title of my message this morning is Consider Your Ways. I want to start from the book of Agai, chapter 1. Can you give us the book of Agai, chapter 1 on the screen? In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Agai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, These people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Agai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not, do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And you hand wages, hand wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. My message this morning is not going to be dwelling about building houses or building temple. I'm just using that phrase advisedly. While I will still dwell on that scripture, but my challenge for us, brothers and sisters of the kingdom, is it's time for us to consider our ways. You know, it's so exciting and a very wonderful thing to give our lives to Christ. We are saved. We were lost. And Jesus located us. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us on the kingdom of the Son He loves. We became new creatures. I would say, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We have peace with God. Sin no longer has dominion over us. We stand firm on the finished work of Christ at the cross of Calvary. Our roads have been washed in that blood and we have become as white as snow. Good as those things may be, we need to consider our ways. The Bible says we should work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Just like God was challenging Israel in the days of Haggai the prophet, he is challenging us today. While we have an inheritance in God, God also has an inheritance in us. And many a times we have not bothered to ask God, what does he want? We are so self-satisfied with our salvation. And everything that concerns us since we are heavenly bound, we can afford to be hardly irrelevant. We are not bothered about the things that bothers God. We are no longer concerned about the things that concerns God. And so all our prayer points are need-driven. And like pastor ministers two Sundays ago, God is aware of your needs, he's aware of your wants, and he's ready to meet them every time in every way. But we do not take time to ask God, 
What does he need? In the book of Agai that we read, for 16 years, the nation of Israel did not even visit the issue of the rebuilding of the temple. Until judgment descended upon them, and the word of God came to them, to the prophet, to the governor, and to the priest. That was when they realized that God also has a need. Because they have been concentrating much more on what they want for their personal lives. So how do we consider our ways? This morning, as the head of the teens ministry was ministering, she was sharing with us so many challenges that our teenagers are going through. Many of them are into drug addiction. Many are into prostitution now. Homosexuality has crept into the children of the kingdom. And it has not, we have not deemed it fit to consider our ways. That what is happening all around us? Is salvation alone? Is it not for us? That I'm born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking. And that's the whole of the gospel. That's what the gospel is all about. There is more from God. And so the first thing I want you to know is that, that beyond your personal salvation, beyond your journey of being heavenly bound, the first thing I want you to consider this morning is that God wants you to request and to meet him at his point of need. And what is the first need of God? Give me Psalm 2, verses 1 to 8. God wants you to ask for the nations. Beyond you in your little cocoon of being saved and never saved, God wants other nations to be saved. God wants his kingdom to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Why do the nations rage? Give us the scripture on the screen, please. And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the heart set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. You who sits in the heavens shall have, the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the hands of the earth for your possession. If you are now begotten sons and daughters of the kingdom, God wants to give us nations. He wants to give us the hands of the heart as our inheritance. And he wants us to possess those nations for him. He will not do it himself. He wants you and I to be the one that will stand in the gap to rescue the nations of the world, including our nation, Nigeria. Because he wants all dominion to become his dominion. Give me Revelations 11, 15 to 19. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were hungry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. The question is that, when will the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ? It can never become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ except you and I took over that kingdom. The Bible says the, the creation is eagerly awaiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. When are we going to manifest sons and daughters of the kingdom? God is waiting for you and I to be relevant to our generation. 
God is waiting and for you and I to rescue nations that are going to destruction, starting from our nation, Nigeria. Every day you open the newspapers or you watch the TV, what you see is bad news. There is nothing encouraging. The enemy is at rage to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But you are now sitting down in a little cocoon, just concerned about ourselves, what we are going to eat, what we are going to drink. Our children will go to school. I'm forgetting that God is going beyond those basic things. That he wants us to heal the nations. He wants us to save the nations. He wants to give us the nations as our inheritance, starting from our nation, Nigeria. I want you to know that God is the God of all kingdoms of the heart without any exception. Second Kings chapter 19, verses 14 to 19. Give us Second Kings 19 of the scripture. God is the God of all the kingdoms on earth without any exception. And Ezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Ezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Ezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Zenacherub, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. Second thing is also ruling in the affairs of men. Because I need to remind us of the attributes of God and why he's still depending upon us despite his power. The Bible says God rules in the affairs of men. And he gives it to whomsoever he wills. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. Familiar scripture. Now, Satan is the enemy of God. Satan is also our own enemy. But you only gain access because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Dominion was never handed over to Satan. But since the fall of Adam, Satan has set up a parallel government. And these governments have continually opposed the government of the living God. Three things that we lost in the Garden of Eden. Number one, we lost dominion. The dominion that God gave unto man, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air. We lost that dominion. Number two, we lost fellowship with God. We lost our intimacy with the Father. And number three, mankind lost the purpose and the meaning for their lives. And see, today a lot of people are still in this wilderness trying to find their feet, not knowing the reason why they were born or brought onto this side of eternity. But unfortunately, the church of the living God today, we have emphasized only the fall of man and the redemption, like I said. We are so much concerned only about our salvation and the salvation of our souls. Souls of members of our family. And of course, how to put food on our table. And we have left what is very touching to the heart of God. The kingdom of this world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Acts chapter 3 verses 18 to 21 speaks of the restoration of all things. Give me Acts 3, 18 to 21. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ will suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. This is Peter speaking. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Since the world began. God cannot restore anything without us. God wants to use us for restoration. Are you ready to participate in that restoration? The peaks are on the seven mountains of culture. 
Recently, we are hearing about those they call the Malians. And it became a subject of the social media. For or against those that the devil has set up to influence our youths. That they live a life of defiance to the word of God. A life of defiance to everything that is positive. A life of disobedience to everything that is good. And what is the church doing about it? We are rather praying for our children to be protected. We are rather praying so that our children will not be infected by the Malian spirit. We are forgotten that we are not living in an oasis. We are not living in an island of its own. These same children that you are looking at, your children are still going to meet them one way or the other. They are going to be in the same offices. They are going to be in the same school. Many may mistakenly even marry some of them whose lifestyle is defiance to everything that is good. But instead of the church to rise up, that this is the mountain of family being taken over by the enemy. This is the mountain of the house of entertainment that the enemy is using entertainment to, dis to disorganize and to deceive and to delude our youth. We are busy discussing it. We are busy chatting about it. We are busy sending it over our WhatsApp platform. And nobody has taken time to stand in the spirit and said, no, it's enough of this pig on the mountain of arts and entertainment. Marriages are failing. We are discussing it. Many of our children have been introduced here to get married. They have been sleeping with each other. The smart one will not get married pregnant. The one who knows how to take their way. The ones who are smart enough to protect themselves. They will come shiny. And we will be stretching forth our hands but what is heaven saying about those people who have laid a very wrong foundation for the start of their marriage? And it's only the one that is caught that, is, that gets pregnant. But the others are smarter and they pretend that all is well. Digging the hole of their marriage when it has not started. Consider your ways. Are we considering our ways? Or we are just concerned about salvation? We're not even working out the salvation with fear and trembling any longer. We just sit down in our own little cuckoo and we think everything is okay, if it's okay with my family. Forgetting you are still going outside there. Your children are still going outside there. Some people are in Abuja are taking decisions in respect of your life. Yesterday I was at a dinner. One of us was just appointed a judge in Ogun State. And a lot of our classmates in 1987 law class of Ife. We gathered together and were encouraging ourselves. Some of them have been judges since 2002. And they were sharing with us that it's a wrong time to even become a judge in Nigeria. And many of them were even sharing their experience of how they become judges. Many of our judges pay the wrong price to get to that bench. I remember Sister Uliemi was telling us that and that when they were interviewing her, they said, who, who is your sponsor? Who? He said, no, I'm the candidate of Jehovah God. I don't have anybody. And many of them were sharing their experience of what they have to go through before they can get to the bench. That's why justice is not coming. That's why equity has fallen on the streets. Because whoever pays the piper dictates the tune. If I have to join the court, if I have to sleep around, if I have to pay money to get to that position, then you know that when I get them, you are not going to get any justice. But you are now sitting down here in our little cocoon. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. We are not considering our ways. And many of them were sharing what they have to go through. In fact, the one who was just appointed has been a magistrate for about 23 years or thereabout. And she was sharing it. In fact, she said she's going to write a book on how she got to the bench. What she has to go through. Offers that she has to refuse because she's a child of God. Even when they are going for a meeting in Abuja, they will look at her and say, why are you wearing this? This one is not attractive. Go and wear something more revealing, something that can shake them so that they can put your name. And year in, year out, her name has been omitted because she's not playing the ball the way everybody wants it. But yesterday she was testifying to the goodness of God that for the few years before she retires, she's going to lift up the banner of the gospel. She's going to stand there that this is the candidate of Jehovah and nobody can stop her. Nobody, nobody can influence her or ask for any favor because only God has put her on that bench. But that is what is going on around us. Consider your ways. This is not the time to sit on the fence, brethren. This is not the time to sit behind the four walls of our church and think everything will change. That is what consumed pastor, our serving overseer. And people will think, is this man crazy? No, because of what he has heard, what he has seen. 
And when you see some of this and you hear them, you begin to ask yourself that we go to the courtroom to play games. You go there for theater hearts. Sometimes judgments have been written. Sometimes lawyers write judgment that a judge will read because all kinds of things have gone underground. And I stand there, I'm saying it. I'm in the profession, I've been there now for 31 years. And I know what my eyes have seen. And I know how frustrating sometimes it can be because they have already reached a conclusion before your case even starts. But we need to crush all these things in the spirit. Consider your ways. That is the challenge God is giving to us. We need to chase the garrison or the Philistines already on the mountains of God. Every seven mountain of culture, the enemies are sitting down there occupying it. And they are moving from generation to generation. Just like God will not fail to have a witness in every generation, Satan is also having witness in every very generation. Yeah. Where are these Malian people just coming from nowhere? Where are they coming from? Who taught them? Who are their parents? Where did they grow up? You know, my mother sometimes makes me laugh. When you see some of these children, um, Ms. Baby, we say, look, she won't come when they quit, one but on Did they really congratulate the parents when these sons are born? Because when you see some of the things that they are doing, we begin to wonder it will have been better they were not born at all. But it's the business of the church to rise up. Consider your ways. How are we considering our ways? Or like, we are the, like the Israel that sat for 16 years and not rebuilt the temple of God. The kingdom is dilapidating. And as I move closer, some few years ago, I and Elder Adrian and I were concerned about a particular boy. Right in our toilet, male toilet there. After service, they were engaging in homosexuality. Yes, it's close to that than you can think. Your children sitting down all here and pretending as if they are Christians. They are not serving God. Some of them are lost. We need to bring them back home. Unfortunately, we are not preparing for war in the time of peace. Abraham prepared 318 soldiers in his house when there was no war. He never knew Lot was going to be kidnapped or taken captive. But he has prepared for war in the time of peace and was able to go out there to rescue his nephew. Are you prepared for war in the time of peace? Or you are just sitting down there thinking everything is okay? Let's pastor continue to make his own noise and go to Abuja. Or we'll be there well someday. No, God is waiting for you. God is waiting for me. God is waiting for when you and I are going to manifest. There's no manifestation in the graveyard, though. This is where we have to manifest as the sons and daughters of the living God. And so we must become like Joseph in Egypt, bringing solutions. That's our vision. That's our mission at the Citadel Global Community Church. We must become like Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the land of Babylon. We must become like Esther and Mordecai. These two people rescued the whole nation from the hand of Haman, the Agagite. They were not sending WhatsApp messages or sitting down. They took action in the spirit so that their nation would not be de defeated. The king does not know anything. Azara will have allowed Haman to destroy every one of them. If Esther and Mordecai has not risen up, consider your ways, brethren. What about Paul in Rome, Acts 27 and 28? For the sake of time, we will not be able to go into it. Consider your ways. The future belongs to intercessors. Are you interceding for all these things that I'm mentioning? Are you interceding for our children, for generations coming after us? Children beyond your own children. If your children are well behaved and they are good, do you know where they are going to marry? Do you know the deception that is out there? Today now, even marital status is about to be removed from some forms. Sex is about to be removed because Adam is wedding Steve. Eve is marrying Evelyn. And it's going to get to a stage where nobody is going to have any, there's, no good, there's going to be any nine any longer. The lines are going to be blood about the sexes. And it's happening already. Male and male are even adopting children. How are they going to raise up that child with two men in the house? One is a mom, one is a dad. The child life of that child is already warped. The foundation has been destroyed already. What good can come out of that? But we are not supposed to marvel at those things. We are supposed to stand in the spirit. We are supposed this kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. It's for us to crush those things. Give me 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because when we read about the end times, the last days, we think God wants us to draw, lift up our hands and say, no, nothing we can do. 
He said, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives or gullible women loaded with sins, led away by various laws, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are in the church too. Now as James and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further. For their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. So it's not as if God is giving up. God is just mentioning the things that are going to happen. And he's giving you an eye, the assignment to rise up and oppose those one who will carry that spirit of the end times. The perilous people that are going to bring the perilous times. He's waiting for you and I to stand toe to toe with the devil to stop the enemy dead in his tracks. So that the days of heaven can come on earth. So that the continuous interaction between heaven and earth will be on in there, in that. In the mighty name of Jesus. So God is looking for us. God is waiting for us. He wants us to consider our ways. That your salvation alone is not enough. God wants to go beyond that. He wants to save nations. He wants to save destinies. He wants to rescue marriages. He wants to rescue homes. You are not supposed to sit down and begin to discuss those things. We are supposed to rise up and to take over. Church, what time is it? Why? Look at the way you are talking. No energy inside of it. It doesn't even appear. I deliberately, I didn't want to say it with you. We are, we are forgotten. We are forgotten. The enemy has taken over already. It is time to take over. Rise up on your feet this morning and let's take over. I wonder whatever God has put in your spirit. Marriages, our children. That the things teachers led us this morning. We are rescuing our children from the hand of the enemy. We are stopping the Malian in their tracks this morning. That spirit behind that disobedience, we are crushing it in the mighty name of Jesus. This is the church of the firstborn. I want you to lift your voice unto heaven this morning, Lord. We are taking our marriages back. We are taking our children back. We are taking our economy back. We are chasing the pigs out of the mountains. It is time to manifest. It is time to take over. There are wars to fight. There are giants to kill. There are cities to take. We are God's warriors. We are giant killers. We are city takers in the name of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Lord, we stop the enemy this morning that the wave of darkness that is raging over our society, we put a stop to it in the name of Jesus. We rescue our sons, O Lord God, from strange children. Our children shall be taught by the Lord. Grace shall be their peace. In righteousness, they shall be established. In their own peace, we will also find peace in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of disobedience today, we crush them out of this place in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of homosexuality, sexual morality, drug addiction, tramadol, in their hand. Today we crush them in the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against the enemy. This day, this morning, Lord, this assembly of the firstborn will raise your standard, Holy Spirit. Against every force of darkness that want to consume our children, that want to destroy our homes or destroy our marriages, that want to destroy our economy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are Joseph in Egypt, we are Daniel in Babylon, we are Esther and Mordecai rescuing our whole nation from the hand of the enemy. We are rescuing them from the hand of every Haman who wants to destroy them. No, 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 no. We say no to the enemy. We say no, we take territories back. We take the mountains back. We chase the pigs out of it in the name of Jesus Christ. Every garrison of the Philistine, we kick out of the mountain of the Lord. For the mountain of the Lord shall be upon every mountain. All the nations shall flow into it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. We bless your name. We glorify you, Lord. Thy kingdom come, O Lord. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, everlasting Father. 
Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your name, Lord. Oh, blessed be your name, Lord. You are the man of war. Thank you for your mercies. Let's have a seat. Consider your ways. Up and make incense this morning. It's to re-energize or to revive us. The next point will shock you. Because there's a cost on that. And I pray it's going to be removed over our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. The second reason why we must consider our ways is that the church is sleeping. And I'm not talking just about Citadel Global Community. I'm church of the entire body of Christ. The church is sleeping. Zion is at ease and complacent. That's why what we have read about perilous times and perilous people. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. Zion is at ease and complacent. And there is consequences when Zion is at ease. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Are you hearing me this morning? Yeah. Said, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. If the church is not sleeping, Paul will not be writing to the Thessalonians. Well, let me show you the consequences of Zion being at ease and being complacent. Give me Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6 verse 1. Woe to you at ease in Zion and trust in man Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Sevaniah chapter 1 verse 12. Sevaniah 1 verse 12. This is the message for men. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lambs and punish the men who are settled in complacency. Who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Give me Isaiah 32 for the women. Isaiah 32 verses 9 to 14. It appears the punishment of the women is greater than that of the men. Say, rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a year and some days, you'll be troubled, you complacent women. For the vintage will fail, the garden will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves, make yourself bare. And God sack, Lord, on your waist. People shall mourn upon their breasts. For the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come out thorns and briars. Yes, on all the happy homes in the joyous city. Because the palaces will be forsaken. The bustling city will be deserted. The forts and towers become layers forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. That is the punishment for complacency. That when we are set to down in our little cocoon that have been saved, and if I close my eyes today, I will get to heaven. But son of man, you have not done what I ask you to do. That the kingdom is not just about you, it's about the need of the Almighty God Himself. Who wants all men to be saved? Who want all nations to be saved. So that the whole heart will be covered with the glory of God. 
as the water has covered the sea. But you and I are sleeping. Zion is at sea. But note verses 15 to 20 of that Isaiah 32. That when the complacency stops, when we repentance, look at what God will do. Until the Spirit is poured on us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. And the fruitful field is counted as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation. Amen? In secret dwellings and in quiet resting places. Though hail comes down on the forest, and the city is brought low in humiliation, blessed are those who sow beside all waters, who sent us freely the feet of the hogs and the donkey. That is what comes when you are not complacent. When you repent, there will be an pouring of the Spirit of God. And that will be our portion, even as Nigerians, and to other nations of the world in the mighty name of Jesus. But our complacency must stop. Consider your ways. And maybe you have not put in yourself, you know, the story in Daniel of the scale of the Almighty. If you are now put on that scale this morning, it's, ready to, it's easy for us to talk about many, many, take a look for sin. But if you are now the one that put on that scale, what are you going to measure this morning? If God puts you on the scale of the Almighty this morning, what will I weigh? What is your stature in the spirit? You know God keeps record. What is he writing to your account in heaven? What will you weigh on the scale of the Almighty? Give me Revelation 3. Verses 1 to 6. This is a prototype of some church. You are aware of this letter to the seven churches. But it's not talking just of physical people alone. It is the people that make the church. You are now the church. So I'm not talking only collectively. I'm talking individually this morning. And to the angel of the church inside is right. This thing says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works that you have a name that you are alive. But you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Some are already dead. Other things are about to die. And you don't know. Oh, Funra, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, you will not, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even inside this who have not defied their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me consider another church. Give me verse 14 to 22. The church of Laodicea. Those are the ones who are neither hot nor cold. They know God. They know all the principles. But they are not living in accordance with the word of God. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, read those seven churches and pick the one that you are part of it. And ask yourself whether you are measuring up to standard or not. This thing says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That means you will so irritate me, I will vomit you. I don't want to see you around me. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with high salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into and he with me. May you not shut the door of your life to God. May you not shut the door of your spirit to God. May you remain open at all times for correction, 
for reproof. May you be open at all times for God to speak to you in the mighty name of Jesus. So the adversities, adversities some of us are suffering today is a summons from heaven. It's a wake-up call from heaven. Just like when God was dealing with them in the book of Haggai, he messed up their finances. They were making money, made holes in their pockets because he was trying to get their attention. That what you have left undone for 16 years, I want you to do it. And the moment you do it, you see a change. I said, that's the message. Many of us are going through some forms of adversity. I'm not saying all adversity as a result of disobedience. But sometimes God sends adversity like he did to the Israelites in Nagai so that he can get your attention. Adversity is a summons from heaven to consider your ways, to examine them, and to see whether you are working right, whether you are not living undone, the things God wants you to do, whether you are asking for the nations to be your inheritance, whether you are already manifesting as the sons and daughters of the kingdom, wherever you find yourself. And if you are operating on any mountain, whether the pigs are still there on that mountain where you are sitting down there, or you are chasing those pigs away and establishing the purpose of God upon the mountains of God. And so I pray that God will make us to consider our ways and his name alone will be glorified. Finally, consider your ways again. Why do we need to consider our ways? Many of us don't tremble at the word of God any longer. We are so used to the word of God. We are here this morning now. By 9.30, this service is over. I have the rest of the Sunday of this Sunday to do whatever I like. If I like, I can come for CBS, CIBS on Wednesday. Maybe that's the time you are going to hear the word of God again. Many of us, this Bible, once it's closed today, it will open again next Sunday. And if you don't come for CIBS on Wednesday, that's another one week. So you don't know what is in the heart of the Father any longer. Sometimes people like us too. We have the weakness of only opening because I want to prepare a message. Forgetting that it's not this message that God is looking for. God is looking for me. He's looking for everyone who is ministering. That you open the Bible only because you have something to say. Forgetting that that is your life. Say the word that speak to you. They are spirit and they are life. Do you read the Bible because you want to go and minister somewhere? Or so that people will know that you are loaded with the scriptures? Or you read the word of God because of the life that is inside it? God said, I've exalted my word above my name. The highest manifestation of God Almighty is his word. What are you doing with that word? If you don't even read that, you tremble at that word. Many of us no longer tremble at the word of God. Isaiah chapter 66, please. Give me Isaiah 66. As I round up this message this morning. Consider your ways, ladies and gentlemen. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the heart is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Those are the people God is going to look up to. Those are the people God is looking at. Those are the people God is lifting up his countenance towards because they tremble at his word. Now your salvation experience and many miracles you think you have enjoyed cannot sustain you to tremble at the word of God. You will fail like Peter failed. Give me Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 to 8. Sometimes even when you see the physical manifestation of the power of God, after some time you enjoy it, you forget it. You must stay connected for you to be able to tremble at the word of God. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son. He knew man well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they heard this voice of God. Not the one they were writing, no. Not the one that is written. No, directly from heaven. 
And when the disciples had it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. Will you imagine that these three guys, Peter, James, and John, that they would betray Jesus? Having seen this manifestation of the power and the word of God, they had just like Moses was hearing God directly. These people also have the privilege. And God brought Moses and Elijah for them to see. But what happened when Jesus was arrested? Peter denied Jesus three times. That means there's nobody that cannot fail at trembling at God's word. Even Peter, James, and John, all of them betrayed. But they repented. It was only Judas that did not repent. He regretted his action. So the fact that you've been experiencing salvation, you speak in tongues, and because you have been blowing that all over the place and you think you have been having miracles in your life, does not mean you tremble at the word of God. If Peter can fail, you and I can fail. But Jesus said, I have prayed for you, Peter, so that you can come back. So don't be too sure of yourself. The question you should ask over is consider your ways. Do I tremble at the word of God? Because no matter the manifestation of the word of God to some of us, once we finish one miracle at the Israelites, we begin to grumble of another one. When manna is served today, we are thinking of meat the next day. We do not can tremble, tremble at the word of God. So God will help us so that we will not procrastinate. We will not postpone the need of God. We we'll meet him promptly. Because when God told Abraham that, look, take your son, your only begotten son. The Bible says he took a journey. The highest form of obedience is worship. He said, I and the Lord will go and worship. He did not delay one time. But God was already on that mountain before he got there. And did not allow him to sacrifice his son. Because if he has not given up his son, Jesus would not have been given to us. So consider your ways. Do you tremble at the word of God? Do you obey God promptly when you receive instructions? Or you procrastinate for 16 years like they did in the book of Haggai? Now, what are the characteristics of those who tremble at the word of God? Number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. God says it's going to be with the lowly, with the poor, with those who have contrite spirit. And Jesus, when he was speaking on that mountain of Olive, also repeated the same thing. That blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are not full of themselves. Those who are humble enough to say, Lord, you are the one that will help me in this journey. You are the one that will help me to please you. Because only God that can please God. Matthew 5, chapter 3. Number 2, they enjoy God's presence. Isaiah 57, verse 15. Those who tremble as God's word, they enjoy God's presence. They are not proud people. James 4, 6, God despises the proud. He gives grace to the humble. They are not profane people. You will not see any profanity in their speech or in their way of life. 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21. 2 Timothy 2, 14 to 16. They are not profane people. 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21. 2 Timothy 2, 14 to 16. They are not presumptuous too. They are not presumptuous. 2 Peter 2, 4 to 11. Numbers 15, chapter, verse 30. They hunger and thirst for the word of God. Matthew 5, 6. They hear God, Isaiah 66, 5. And finally, those who tremble at the word of God are the only ones who can say they are the temple of God Almighty. If you don't tremble at God's word, you are not his temple. That's why you see God say, Where, what are you going? Give me Isaiah chapter 66 again. Isaiah 66. God wants to enter into them by his spirit. He said, heaven is my throne and the heart is my full stool. He said, where is the heart that you will build me and where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, who is on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit 
and old trembles. Those are the temples that God is looking for. It's not even the temple of Solomon. It's not any physical building. It is you and I. If we tremble at the word of God, then you will have the right to say, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you don't tremble at his word, you cannot be his temple. Those who tremble at the word of God are ready to become the doormat at the gate of God. They don't mind anybody's cleaning his shoes or doing anything on there. They don't complain. They forsake everything. They accept everything for the sake of Christ. David says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tent of wickedness. Psalm 84 verse 10. Those are the people who tremble at the word of God. Stand to your feet this morning. I want you to pray for yourself this morning. Lord, help me to tremble, tremble at your word. I cannot help myself. If Peter can fail, James and John can fail. After that experience on the mount of transgression, I don't see the manifestation of miracles that you can have that will make you to tremble at God's word. But ask God to captivate your heart and establish his kingdom in your heart so that you can tremble at his word. Reign in me, sovereign Lord, reign in me, reign in me, sovereign Lord, reign. Lord in us this morning. May He captivate our heart and establish His kingdom. May He rule and reign in every area of our lives in the name of Jesus. Father, we are grateful to you this morning. Thank you for your word, Father, that none of these words will stand against us in the day of judgment. Having done all, say that unworthy servant, help us, Father, to please you. Empty us of ourselves and pour yourself inside of us. For it's only God that can please God. Help us to be more like you. Every inch of the way in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. Blessed be your name, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we are prayed. Thy amen is low. In the mighty name of Jesus, we are prayed. Amen and amen. Consider your ways. Are you blessed this morning? Are you excited? God is faithful, but we need to energize ourselves. We need to revive ourselves. We need to encourage ourselves. Consider your ways this week. As you go on on the journey of life, as you go out today again, as you go home after service today, consider your ways. That God is watching you and is waiting for you. God bless you.